how does a good man become even better? By working out? Or by working his way up the corporate ladder? By changing his diet? Or by changing his style? By traveling the world? Or by staying perfectly still? For 300 years, we've helped good men become the best versions of themselves through a dedicated fraternity and by taking an oath to live a life of integrity, service, and brotherly love. Men who are as committed to each other and their families as they are to our noble cause. In the end, we don't just make men better, we make them Masons. Not just a man, a Mason. James Bond. No, not really. Dave Glatley, greeting you here from sunny Florida. We're here at the beautiful villages. We're on our annual trek to visit Scottish Rite Masons here in Florida. We started in Port St. Lucie, went to Naples, went to Sarasota, here at the villages, and then we move on to Tampa before we head home. We're here visiting our 7,500 Scottish Rite Masons of the Northern Masonic jurisdiction that reside or are snowbirds here in Florida. I welcome you to tonight's live stream because this is something you asked for. You asked for more education and you asked for more interaction and that's what we're giving you. 
Now, tonight's live stream is called for How Fraternalism Creates Character. And I know that you will find it interesting, inspiring, educational, and maybe even some fun. I would like to thank illustrious John Sullivan, 33rd degree, from the Valley of Worcester, Massachusetts, and illustrious Sandy Carson's 33rd degree from the Valley of Burlington in Vermont for leading this discussion this evening. I know you'll find the evening enjoyable, but stay tuned to the end because we're going to unveil something special that will help us in our brother to brother program for the Northern Masonic jurisdiction. Welcome brothers to our live stream tonight. We're very glad you could make it. We're excited about it. We're particularly excited about this night's uh, subject, how fraternalism transforms character. And uh, this is the first in what will be a series exploring Masonic uh, values, Masonic obligation in everyday life. I'm joined by brothers John Sullivan and Sandy Carson's. Welcome, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. We're Thanks, real excited man. to have you here. Um, I guess the first question um, is starting at the beginning, and I'd love to hear a little bit about you guys, um, maybe make a little introduction for the, the brothers that are joining us, but also what was the inspiration and what was the force behind this particular subject? Sure, thanks, Lynn. Uh, you know, uh, I come from the Valley of Worcester right here in Massachusetts, and uh, I was fortunate enough to have uh, been Most Wise Master there and, uh, and also uh, in the Valley of Boston as a member of the uh, consistory family. So uh, my Masonic roots go back to my grandfather and my mother's side, and uh, it's, uh, it's always uh, been something that's been in the back of my mind uh, as a young man. And then when I got the opportunity as an older uh, as my kids grew up, I was uh, able to free myself up and give the time to uh, the fraternity. So. Terrific. Sandy, all the way from Burlington, Vermont? Yes, indeed. A uh, little bit of a distance, but uh, the weather cooperated, which was very helpful. Uh, for me, if you're looking at just as a way of getting introduced, um, I had uh, my great-grandfather, who was a Mason, and when he, uh, my grandfather passed away, I'd gotten a bunch of his stuff that he'd stored that ended up on my desk. Mm -hmm. And so essentially it was, oh, what is all this stuff? And that basically is where things began for me um, in the Masonic start. So 2004 is when I've only been in this for 14 years. Great. Well, you know, um, as, as Masons, uh, you know, we all take an obligation and, and there's certain elements of that obligation. And um, it uh, it's really is a, a, a way of living one's life. So tell me um, why today, um, you know, a little bit of why you guys, this was very much something you wanted to do, you felt was important. Tell me about the inspiration behind the subject. So certainly when the uh, Northern Masonic jurisdiction came out with uh, the uh, results of the survey mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we saw what was in, in that survey and, and if you could read between the lines, you could understand um, as a Mason what the brothers were looking for and sure. it, because we were looking for it ourselves in, in a greater or lesser fashion so uh, it was real easy to see that what a lot of our, our brothers were looking for was more education in, in masonry and how do we turn uh, the things that we learn in the degrees not only in the Blue Lodge but in Scottish Rite how do we turn those things into everyday uh, life what, what, what are the values how do we translate those values to everyday life in, in our families, in our businesses, in, in, in our friendships, and um, outside the lodge wall. So that's where, uh, you know, that's where for me this really uh, is, is an important piece to uh, bring forward to the brethren. Right? I think the idea of the, uh, the fraternity and brotherhood, uh, kind of getting to the, the surveys, what you found is that usually top on the list for many of these was that what, what the brothers liked was the idea of getting together with sure. other brothers, the, the fraternal aspect. And I think that's what rose to the surface as a way to kind of leverage where we were going to go for this first topic. And so that's kind of where the birth of the fratern fraternalism came, came about and then tweak it to, to kind of bring it into everyday life, how that affects us and why that's important. Right. Well, one of the questions I suppose that we should, uh, we should start with and, um, is fraternalism. It's something we hear a lot. We hear fraternity. We know what a fraternity is. But fraternalism, you know, and how it transforms character. Let's talk about fraternalism. And what is it? I mean, how do you feel it? How do you be fraternal? 
and how does that translate into, uh, into your life on a daily basis? Well, I, I actually was picking up on one of the questions that kind of came in here that kind of asked about the, the maybe if, if, if you want to semanticize this, a brotherhood and fraternity. Yeah. And I almost sort of think fraternity might be more of an umbrella mm -hmm. concept in which, you know, you've got fraternities on campus, you've got a fraternity of people or folks that are getting together. The, the sense of brotherhood might lend itself to a much deeper current. So yeah, you got a bunch of guys together. Eh, that's fraternity, that's good. But there's something about the, the term brotherhood for me would be that deeper undercurrent that links you much more deeply than just simply a bunch of guys who know each other. Right, and you? And, and I think it, the, the core of it is, is example. You know, there, there are wonderful examples uh, for in the fraternity of men who are doing good works in their everyday lives, what they, what they bring to their community, what they bring to their family, what they bring to the lodge, and, and how does that example then translate? How does a young man or a, or a man coming into this fraternity sit and watch and lead and, and learn by example what these brothers are doing? And to me, that's where the, that's where the transformation, you know, and mm -hmm. we, we're talking about transforming character in fraternalism. Uh, that's where the transformation begins. We learn the, the values and we learn the uh, the tenants and all of the things uh, that the degrees tell us and and then you are able to actually see that in a, a living example of a man before your eyes as you get to know him and get deeper into understanding what he does for a living what you know what his family is all about and how he comports himself and then you can then transform yourself by example and say that's the kind of man that I want to be and and there's so many great you know men in this fraternity that you can look to as an example of of how to comport yourself in everyday life so uh, I guess one of the questions I would ask is um, for young men um, growing up uh, that are not in the fraternity um, is can Masons have an effect on the younger generation even outside bringing them into the fraternity and talk a little bit about just walking through the everyday life outside of the lodge. Um, if the answer, of course, we think if they become, you know, join the fraternity, as you say, they're going to have great role models. They're going to learn and be taught and, and, you know, by osmosis even see. But tell me about, you know, walking through the streets figuratively. You know, how can Masons affect change, especially with the younger generation? Well, I think bringing them in, um, ultimately, this is, this is kind of like a seed process. Mm -hmm. So if you entice these individuals with a, a situation uh, where they are surrounded by good, decent people with a certain moral standing compared to what they see on the, in the profane world, if you will, the everyday world, they come in and they see this. And in a sense, you're hoping that by that touching, they bring themselves back out into the world and they've already begun that transformation. Now they're gonna start thinking about, oh, that was really nice. You know, those folks really thought about each other. Hey, that's something I like. And then they bring that out to their friends and their friends say, wow, what's this place, uh, this, this fraternity you've, you've joined? Well, it's, it's a group of guys and they, they really have this deep sort of sense of each other, taking care of each other. Wow, that's pretty good, tell me more about it. So I, I, I like the idea of it kind of spreading. You bring one in and you, you show them what it's about and then it spreads. And, and I, I also think that uh, what we found from the survey and what we found from the responses was clear to me that the, the younger generation is, is searching for the values of Freemasonry. They may not be able to identify exactly what those are, uh, but they, they are searching for a place where they can actually be part of something greater than themselves and learn the next right thing to do uh, that maybe doesn't come from the street. Maybe you're, you're not getting that in your, uh, your, your education process nowadays. You know, we don't teach necessarily fit civ uh, civics anymore. And, uh, you know, the, there's, a, there's a great desire, I believe, among the younger generation to um, really attach themselves to something that is going to give them those values, those core, um, those core things that they know that they want and that they need, but they just don't know exactly where to get it. And Freemasonry has always been there for that. It's always been there to be a place where uh, men could become, uh, you know, what they always wanted to be. And we learn through the lessons how to do those things uh, through the symbolism, through the, you know, through all of the, you know, the, the, the examples that the degrees do tell us about. Then 
well, where is the mechanism to translate that? And I think the mechanism to translate that and to transform as this program is talking about tonight is through the fraternalism. You've got the degrees, you've got the lessons, then you have the example. And, and men, the young men of today are looking for good examples to follow and to lead, uh, you know, lead them to where they want to be. They're, they're becoming family you know, men themselves. They're having children. They're understanding that this, this has to be transformative for their children as well. And I think Freemasonry is the exact place where they can get what they're, they're looking for. I, I think that's a perfect example because also when you've got your, your young family, you're out in the world and you're seeing a lot of the things that are going on today which isn't exactly inspiring. So you think, wow, this is a group of men that I can get together with that while I'm raising my kids and I'm trying to get into life as well, I have examples that show me what it means to be a good person, what it means to be with other men, how it means to be a good gentleman. This is a great example, I think, for, for these kids that are growing up in such a rough society. It's, it's like a breath of fresh air. So let's talk a little bit about that. So you know, tonight's subject um, also is a very powerful word, is transformation, mm -hmm. and another one, which is character. So um, it, it, let's talk a little bit about what we mean by that. You know, what, what type of transformation are we talking about? Uh, what type of character traits are we um, trying to instill in, uh, in the brothers through the fraternity? You know, it's 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 funny when you know we're obviously preparing for tonight's you know discussion, and uh, you look at the old English words that we use in our degrees, and uh, words like prudence and mm -hmm. toleration, and uh, you know just words that you don't hear anymore in society. Yet the founding uh, fathers of this country and uh, Freemasonry chose those words very specifically. You know, the the word courage has been around as long as the word fortitude, mm -hmm. but they didn't use the word courage. They used the word fortitude because it has a little different flavor to it. And the same thing with you know, prudence and justice. They, they could have used other words to describe uh, the, the way that uh, we describe character in uh, Freemasonry, yet they chose those words because there is a, there's a deeper undercurrent and it means a little bit different thing to be prudent uh, than it does just to have you know, um, just to make good choices, mm -hmm. you know? So when we talk about a, a, a word like prudence and we talk about character, it's, it's up to the individual Mason to then take and delve into that subject of prudence and say, how does this affect me? How am I going to be prudent? And, and it's a challenge in today's world because that's not a word that we use very often, but that lends itself to the educational piece. That lends itself to a, a, a brother taking that one word and actually delving into his own character and say, how can I do that? How can I become prudent? And it, it, it's easier to understand it once you get involved in Freemasonry and you see how other men are being prudent in their lives. How do they, how do they make those choices that, uh, you know, not to overindulge, not to, um, you know, not to make this particular choice versus this particular choice and using prudence as their judging, their measuring stick. Uh, and, and then that transforms the, young, the next generation and the next generation after that. Can you guys talk a little bit about your own transformation? Uh, so maybe we can get some, a little bit of a, a story of, you know, a situation where maybe you've grown in, in any of these values we talk about, um, or um, it may not be personally you or when you've been able to use these teachings to help someone else grow in a certain way. Um, and it could be uh, another brother or it could be just you know, uh, some of you, I'm sure you touch many people in the community as a firefighter. Um, talk a little bit about that so we can maybe add some color to this to, you know, what do we mean by transformation? Give me an example. So I, I think, you know, one of the things I, in trying to imagine that, that concept, the thing that came to mind was if you imagine watching your kids grow up, you grow with your kids. So you don't notice it until somebody shows you a picture of your kids way back when. You go, oh, wow, that's changed a lot. So when you try and turn that around on yourself, it's actually pretty difficult to suddenly say how much have you transformed because you go along with it. Sure. So the thing I would say is that the transformation is, is in a sense, a self-awareness. It's an awareness of the plights of your brothers. It's an awareness that you're being more honest. It's an awareness that your, your integrity is growing. So it's a self-awareness. You're, you're thinking. You get into situations where you find yourself saying, oh, uh, I'm being, I'm trying to be honest here. 
You, you think of that. Mm -hmm. you, you physically think of that. So it's this self-reflection that says, oh, I'm thinking of these things more. And a lot of times what pops into your mind is something from the ritual. It's something that you've seen another brother do mm -hmm. or something that you've kind of confronted while you've been in the fraternity. So you self-reflect and you, you use these examples that you've kind of grown with while you've been in the fraternity to give you an idea of what's been happening. So in a sense, you've gotten markers that have helped you to understand that there has been a transformation. It's just very subtle to realize it. Right. And, and, and as, a, as an older Mason, uh, you know, it's, it's a wonderful thing to watch a young man walk in the door and wide-eyed and looking for inspiration and um, you put the craft, set the craft to work and, and you, you give them tasks to, to complete. And, and then the, the natural um, exuberation that comes from a, a job well done and then the accolades of the, uh, the older brethren. And I, I remember as a young Mason, you know, the, the people who inspired me in Lodge and, and having them come up to me and say, hey, you did a great job on that middle chamber. You did a wonderful job tonight with collation. And, and just having that affirmation yeah. of the things that, uh, you know, you know are right and good and you just, you're that whole piece of giving to others so that you can grow on the inside. Uh, and you know when we when we bring in uh, new new members, potential candidates, one of the things that they inevitably say is, "I want to give back. I mm -hmm. want to give back to the community. I want to be part of something, yeah. something bigger. I want to be a part of a, a charitable organization." And then we 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 give them th that that opportunity, and and that's what that's what Mason really really does is it gives them the opportunity. It's it's up to that individual Mason to then take those opportunities and and grow with them uh, we can escort them along the way and give them the example and be you know be there to guide them uh, but eventually it, it's it's a self driven you know uh, motivation to be able to uh, make that transformation uh, masonry itself is not transforming the person the person is transforming themselves through masonry so um, one of the words that um, you had said earlier um, was challenge and um, you know I want to look at that and, and you know maybe look at you know the, the uh, brethren that are watching tonight and participating and um, I didn't mention earlier but of course if they have questions they please do um, send some questions some of the things that I've been feeding you guys have actually come in as we've been talking um, so the um, the challenge that maybe some folks are thinking about is uh, at the Blue Lodge level you know, how do I do this? How do I bring someone outside of the ritual itself? I mean, there's not that you meet once a month, uh, you know, outside of uh, Lodge of Instruction, you know, there's business to be attended to. Mm -hmm. um, how do you get the time to really help um, really enforce, aside from obviously, I think one of the answers is things like live streams um, <laughs> can, can certainly help um, having these conversations. But how do you do this in your own lodge, in your own life? I think that, you know, one of the things I try to, to sort of convey uh, for a lot of people, because I see the, the old style view of going to a lodge meeting and then going home. So there's, there's sort of a marker of, well, there's, there's my duty, and then I come home, and I see the brothers, that's great, and then I go home. But I'd like to think of masonry as, as almost a way of life sure. that you begin to adopt. It becomes a part of it. It infuses what you do and everything that is part of you. So ultimately, I think that you try and encourage these folks to realize that, yeah, you go to a meeting, that's a way to meet the brothers physically and see them again, but also you should be taking home a lot of these thoughts and things that you've learned in the lodge. I spend a lot of time reading about things at home mm -hmm. so that it infuses what I do beyond the borders of the physical lodge. So that contribution goes beyond just simple meetings. Understood. And, and I think, Len, that, uh, you know, in today's society where everybody is really challenged for their time, uh, you know, we, we've got so many competing, uh, you know, aspects to uh, our day, whether it's work or children or, uh, or whatever it is. Um, the, the idea of, of uh, being available to a brother uh, outside the lodge right. mm -hmm. is, is, a, is a challenge, uh, yet the master of the lodge and the officers of the lodge are, are admonished, if you will, and take an obligation 
uh, to set the craft at work and give them necessary instructions. So in that sense, these folks are, are obligated to set aside time for their brothers. We, we take those obligations and we take them seriously to, to help a poor and distressed brother. Well, what does that exactly mean? Well, it means something different for, for, for each one of our brothers. It's not necessarily someone who's having a financial problem, but it could be. Mm -hmm. It could be someone who just needs a little time, needs to, to talk to someone, and needs to work through uh, an issue that they're, they, they're confronting in their everyday life. Now, we're not necessarily social workers, but we are brothers, mm -hmm. and brothers listen, and they, you know, they take the time to listen and, 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 and be there for their, their, their brethren. And so that is a challenge, and, and I think it's something that uh, becomes instilled in a lodge that takes the time uh, to, to care for each of its members. And, th and that's something that uh, we lost a little bit along the way. And something that the survey certainly showed is that, you know, I came in and then I didn't show up for a couple of weeks or a month or whatever and nobody called me. Mm -hmm. That's just habitual. That's just something that the lodge has to make a part of its everyday routine or its, its lodge routine to say that if, if Brother B doesn't show up uh, for two weeks in a row, someone from here, and it doesn't have to be the master, the, the, the junior steward's job is to make a call, whatever the case may be, and make a call and say, hey, we haven't seen you. Is there anything we can do for you? Uh, uh, you know, is everything okay? And, and I think that's an, that's an easier thing to do than it, we make it out to be, but it, it has to be habitual. But to make it even, uh, to go a little bit further on this is that, um, the, the kinds of meetings that you can have don't necessarily have to be formal. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times now we've gotten our brothers that have, have regular uh, social times at the local pub. So we got a bunch of us that have just ended up going there and, and having a great time and it's, it's us. Those are the people that we now congregate with. Uh, that's the brotherhood that's happening and then, and then it sends off from there. So you got another group now that's kind of formed and they have their own little sort of meetings. These social events are not necessarily meeting at a lodge, they're not doing ritual, but you know what? You're getting to learn about your brothers and sometimes a little business shows up too. You kind of <laughs> talk about some things and you think, oh, okay, we just got a whole bunch of stuff done. And, and wow, we didn't have to do it in lodge. Mm -hmm. And we had fun doing it. We sampled a whole bunch of beers. Wow, that was great. For instance. You know, how much fun Didn't is Didn't overindulge, we're prudent. No. Yeah, we're prudent. <laughs> Temperate too. Temperate, Temperate. <laughs> of course. Temperate. Um, Let's talk about, let's get out of the lodge for a second and talk about, you know, one of these things is living in, in, uh, in, in everyday life, Masonic values in everyday life. And the thing that I'm, uh, I can't help but be fascinated as a new ma Mason uh, to, to think about is, um, you know, if, if the ranks, and we're working on it, but the ranks of Masonry were to, um, to grow exponentially, you know, what might society look like today? Um, and, you know, so um, it's, and feel free to, to you know, jump into that, but what I really want to ask is, um, maybe on a smaller scale, how can this work in the workplace? How can this work in, in, in civic interactions? So not necessarily the answer is always to, to bring someone into the lodge right. or our brothers, but let's talk about how a mason can really use the lessons of tolerance and, and prudence, say at work, where those aren't necessarily things that you hear about in the average workplace? Well, I, would, I always like to imagine the, uh, you know, the ring as a kind of badge mm -hmm. and going into your workplace, uh, wherever you have, whether it's work or whatever else you're, you're in, you are now that standard and your application of that sense of honesty, the person that steps up to help out when somebody's having difficulty, the person that you can rely on, that example shown in the workplace or wherever you happen to be begins to infuse in the people around them saying, wow, that's, that's interesting. Oh, he's a mason. I'd love to see that as being almost this incredible gold standard that says, wow, we've got a mason on our team. This is, this is great. Our, we're we're going to win. Uh, you know, we've got a great bunch of guys. And I think that bringing that into the workplace is actually easy. It's a real easy thing. You're bringing your character and the way in which you deport yourself around your fellow people in the workplace, that's what you're, that's what you're bringing to the table. Well, one of the questions I think that's a natural when you think about fraternalism, and, and as you had said earlier, it's really about brotherhood, um, that uh, perhaps a, 
someone not as familiar with the values of masonry, um, that then we talk about the workplace, we talk about gender equality. You know, is brotherhood at odds with gender equality? Oh, I, I don't think so at all. I mean, uh, one of the core tenets of our institution is the, the value of, of, of women and, uh, and the, the uh, universality and equality and toleration of, of all mankind. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, to me, it is a natural um, component of, of what we're teaching in Freemasonry to, to value those, uh, those, that, those things that are uh, inculcated in equality for, for everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, men, women, uh, race, creed, color, religion doesn't matter, you know, to Masonry. It's, it's about the values. I often say that, you know, uh, an old saying becomes an old saying because it's true, not, not for just because it's old. And, and the same holds true for, for values, you know. Uh, values are values. I mean, most people, uh, when, you, when you do testing on people's personality, will come down to a basic core tenet of, of values that they hold dear. And, and what society has allowed over the course of time is for people to trade those values for, for other things. And you lose a little bit of yourself each time you do that. And, and, and to the point where now we, we have this degradation, if you will, of, of those things that we hold dear, like equality, uh, like, like those, you know, those basic tenets are, are eroded in society. And I think that masonry is the place where we can come back to and say, you know, it's okay. It's okay for you to stand up for toleration. It's okay because you know what? It's right. It is, it is just and it is right. And it is part of who you are at your core. You don't have to trade that for anyone because you're a mason. And as Sandy just said, you know, uh, we, we were kind of secret for, you know, a hundred years. Well, we don't have to be secret anymore. It's okay to say, I'm a Mason and I stand for the, you know, universal truths. And one of the universal truths is that, you know, all men are created equal and, and we believe that and we're gonna stand on that and we're gonna stand on, you know, the issues that we, we believe in. Whether they happen to cross over into politics is outside the lodge. That's the way that, you know, that's the way the world works. Uh, but if, if we, we're putting those principles first, then the rest of it takes care of itself. Yeah, we meet on the level. That's our basic tenet that we put in there right. in the sense that we see everybody as being an equal and worthy of our attention. And I think it flows from there. It doesn't matter whether it's a brother, woman, creed, race, whatever it is, this is that equality sense that we're uh, basically infused in on a regular basis with our experience in the fraternity. So um, going back to fraternity, um, and going back to um, you know ways to, uh, to to bring the brothers cl brethren closer together, um, there's a couple of challenges as you know, um, being uh, longtime and uh, standing uh, folks in the fraternity. How do we bring people back together? Maybe the folks that have drifted away, you know. And you mentioned yourself. Maybe some of the things have eroded in in, um, in terms of the teaching and the guidance. Um, in some lodges, many lodges, how do we bring them back? They're, they're uh, brothers that don't attend, uh, and it's not always time, it's not always age. Uh, what can we do as individuals, not as a Supreme Council or a Grand Lodge, but as individual brothers, what can we do? I, I think it goes back again to what I said about an old saying, you know, actions speak louder than words. We've been given lip service to a lot of things for a long time, but our actions have not followed that up. And, and to bring these brethren back, uh, things like this podcast, where we're being honest about what the issues are and taking those on at, at people at face value and say, if this is a problem for our brother, if this brother believes that he was uh, unfairly treated in his lodge because he was X, Y, or Z, because he couldn't learn ritual or because he just didn't show up for a few weeks, whatever the case may be, that we acknowledge that that happens and, and then take some action within the fraternity and it all starts at the individual level to be able to change that. The next man up, the next person who's the master can have a great effect on that lodge just by the way he treats other people using you know, the golden rule. And, and I think that's where we need to, to put our money where our mouth is and that I think what this is doing 
today and this survey has shown us is that those are the things that will bring people back. The values are that what they wanted at the very beginning. Let's bring them the values that they wanted. Let's bring them the resources that they wanted and they sought in Freemasonry. That will bring them back. Look, uh, so, so let me follow up with that. Sure. Um, there's, uh, you know, the lodge itself can be transformative in, in, in itself. So you might get stuck in a certain way in which you've always done things. And maybe that's what has to be broken a little bit. Mm -hmm. At a certain point when you say, look, yeah, we're tired of the old meetings that we've always had. Let's start doing something different. One of those can certainly be, let's get the brothers together. Let's, uh, let's put the gavel down and let's all go out and you know have a beer or whatever, or just go out into the lodge and just say, all right, let's sit down. What can we do different this year? I noticed that brothers A, B, and C haven't shown up. Has anybody contacted them? Why don't we contact them and find out, you know, hey, I haven't seen you for a little while. Uh, are you, are you okay? And, yeah. you know, so ultimately to make a connection and you might get a little bit of data on what's been going on. Yeah, you know, I kind of was, you know, it's hard for me to bring my wife. Uh, I'd like to have some, some more family uh, activities. I have kids right now. Uh, my job is really overwhelming. Whatever the reason, uh, or it, the meetings were boring, uh, whatever it is. That's where you get your little group of brothers round table together and say, look, here's the issues we're confronting. Let's put our heads together and figure out what to do. I have a question for you guys. Um, you know, it, lodges, as, as you say, can be transformed and be in transition and some can be stuck in a rut. Um, you know, others um, are very different. So what if you're a rank and file member, maybe even a recent member, and as you said, they want the values, they don't see that they're getting it. Um, and maybe some of the values they see behavior that they think is um, is against maybe some of the values. What do you do? Um, I think what happens, my guess is they remain silent and maybe don't participate in much. But what would you say to the, the brothers that are out there that maybe say, I wish my lodge um, you know, were more like this. Um, but remember, the lodge uh, is run by a worshipful master. You know, the name in and of itself doesn't really um, open up for debate uh, a lot up in the time. What do you say? What do you do? I, I think there's two avenues. Uh, two, the first avenue is to stand up and be heard on the level as a brother and make your grievances, if you will, for lack of a better term, known. And that, you know, this, this was not necessarily what I came here for. And I'm hoping to get more of X, Y, or Z and, uh, and, and do that. You know, there's, there's a, you know, there's a challenge to that because you may be ostracized. You may be, uh, you know, made to feel, you know, belittled if, if you're, if you're in a situation where that, that old school thinking is still pervasive, um, or every lodge has its own flavor. There are mm -hmm. hundreds of lodges for you to choose from. Just because you were raised in this lodge right. does not mean you cannot go out and Turn affiliate out. with another lodge that has a has more of an atmosphere that suits your liking. Mm -hmm. And and a lot of members do that over time, you know. And that happens in a lot of different uh, societies. Is that you know, especially uh, something like a fraternity like ours, that uh, the, there's there's changes of the way that things, uh, you know end up over time or you can just wait the master out that's a, that's one that happens often uh, and 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 take your turn and hopefully uh, build that process uh, of, of cha transformative change in your term uh, I know for for me my lodge is um, you know uh, almost 225 years old this year and it's a very traditional lodge but we had to change with the times there's a there's a saying uh, that I use in the fire service uh, and it's very much you know applicable here um, and, and it's from a gentleman named Merrill Dye, and it says that if change is happening on the outside faster than on the inside, the end is near. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where we find ourselves in, and you know, and found ourselves in Freemasonry. Uh, and so um, you you cannot stand on those you know those old ways longer than will kill you. <laughs> We're looking for the individual mason that may be in a particular lodge. I mean, we, each situation is incredibly unique. Are there other ones in the lodge that are kind of like him, that are kind of getting frustrated? He's the only one? You know, that, that could change the dynamics a little bit. But certainly, I try to encourage anybody to get out from your little silo. Mm -hmm. Visit other lodges. Get out there. There's lodges in your own district. Go, go further out and see what's going on out in the world in, in masonry to say, hey, wow, I visited that lodge and man, look what they're doing. 
you can use that as leverage to either say, hey, could you guys come to our lodge and give a little talk on the things that you do? Mm -hmm. That could be a, an impetus to help that lodge. It's an interesting thing I wanted to maybe touch on, and I don't want you to lose your train of thought, but um, with, with much of what we've been talking about is from the individual's perspective. Mm -hmm. right. um, you know, I'll share a little bit of an experience that I had that um, a group of us uh, went as a group to a lodge just the next town over. Um, and we uh, attended um, a lodge of instruction as a group. And um, that was, um, it was interesting because we all left saying, you know, there was some pretty cool things. And it wasn't what we were intending at all. But, right. but is this something that maybe, you know, you might consider is, um, is, is going as a group um, to other lodges, and as opposed to someone saying, you know what, you don't oh, like yeah. it here, just start looking around to find another oh, lodge. Oh, absolutely. No, yeah. in fact, I hear of that in some, some lodges will take a bunch of people and all go as a group and say, hey, they're doing some really cool talk, or they're going to do a degree, or a lodge of instruction. Let's get a bunch of us to go over there and do something. So yes, absolutely, it can go beyond just the individual. And maybe we could find a way um, to help promote those things so it's an easy way to yes. know what's going on and right. in the jurisdiction and, and one of the things uh, I, I'm you know fortunate enough to be district deputy grandmaster in my district right now and one of the things that we're really strongly promoting is district-wide uh, you know events and, and, yeah. and making sure that we're right. we're co-mingling you know far more than maybe they did in years past and that uh, we're supporting each other's lodges you know signature events and, and getting out there and making sure that you know, the, you're not just stuck in that silo, that you, you know the members of, you know, Level Lodge as well as you know the members of Trinity Lodge as well as the, you know the members of your own lodge so that, uh, you know, if something cool is coming up, you're, you're, you, you can go alone or you can, you know, look to the left and the right and say, hey, hey you yeah. want to go to, you know, we want to go over to Level, they're having this, you know, really cool, you know, barbecue or smoker or whatever it happens to be and are you available and that would be great and oh, by the way, this is, you know, this is o this is open to the families. This is not this right. is not a closed event, and, and you know, really trying to make this a part of your your social network along with everything else that Masonry brings to you. So, uh, you know, those I, I I absolutely believe that the appendant bodies, uh, Scottish Rite, York Rite, Shrine, Grotto, Eastern Star, you name it. There's you know, there's the myriad of different things that people can belong to just by being a Mason, that there is something out there for everybody. Mm, absolutely. You know, and so many yeah. of our brothers are, 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 are in that, those middle years, if you will, where their children are growing up and they, they become really, really ensconced in Demolay and Rainbow and, and give a lot of time to Masonry, but through their children's and their children and being involved with their children in, in Demolay and Masonry, which is a huge piece of, uh, the puzzle for us in 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 membership later on, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, the the statistics are there for the Demolays and you know how many of them become Masons afterwards, and then the the good feelings that the the Rainbow Girls have, and when they become mothers later on, and they have sons and daughters, and and how that transforms into uh, their children becoming. Um, you know, involved in, in Masonic bodies one way or the other. And so uh, this is a, you know, this, this is a transformation that can, can build on itself and the steam roll down the hill. And I know Sandy's from Vermont, so we'll, we'll use the avalanche, you know, <laughs> phrase, you know, and, and the snowball, just get the snowball going in the right direction and uh, eventually you could have an avalanche. A question that's come in is um, we want to, I want to talk a little bit about education. And um, you know, transformation is the, in, in some respects you could say, it's experience, but it's also um, active uh, experience is, is education. Right. So uh, outside of ritual mm -hmm. um, and the history, you know, what are some practical tips that you might be able to give um, the folks that are listening and how to teach? Not everyone, you're actually a teacher. Right. Um, so this is something that um, I, I, I imagine you studied or maybe it just came natural to you, but reflect maybe on um, teaching moments um, that can happen from brother to brother. That isn't necessarily just about ritual. Right. I mean, it does happen on the spot. A lot of times you'll suddenly stop something and say, hey, did anybody notice why that is? I mean, there's always those opportunities to do, and that certainly is ritual oriented. You can do presentations and people, you know, can get into that, but I've sort of tried to think about turning these things into a little bit more of an interactive kind of thing. So, for example, uh, you, you might do a, a question and answer 
period with some of the brothers. But most recently, what I found is uh, beginning to happen, and we're doing this actually in our York right now, and that is a kind of a, a kind of study guide process in which you do it as a group. So you've got a, a book that you each kind of glean from. It's got questions about ritual, history, whatever it is. And what each person does is to go away and do a reading on this, and then you come together, and then you sit and talk about it. You kind of discuss, you've got a prompter that might have some particular questions to, uh, to go through. So you say, hey, let's, let's focus on this if you can't think of anything already. Uh, and then let's talk about that. Um, those to me are beginning to get people involved. They're not just sitting there hearing somebody present. And in fact, this is the sort of thing we're doing with our degree work in Scottish Rite. And I know you wanted to get away from degrees and rituals, but ultimately it's kind of all part of the package. So when we have our degrees, a lot of times we'll finish off with the degree is done, then we'll have a little discussion time where everybody sits around and says, so what do you, what do you think? What, what happened to Adoniram uh, when he did this? And, and so and you think, oh, okay, so that was going on. Well, how does that relate to you in today's life? So you suddenly take a degree that seems awfully ancient, might be talking about a biblical thing, and then you have a discussion about it, and then you start re relating it to your everyday experiences, and you go, wow, that was pretty incredible. So those to me are educational moments that are, are so um, dynamic. And I found that people like this. This is really exciting. It gets them involved in it. They're not just passive mm -hmm. when they go through this. So there's an involvement in this education process. And this process. is something you could see happening in a, uh, instead of just ending with the ritual. Absolutely. And running off, I mean, not that there's anything wrong with congratulating no, no. them and have, let's go have a beer, but spending, you know, just at least a few minutes saying, Let's talk about, you know, outside of the, the, the way that it's presented and as you say, it's kind of ancient a lot of the time. What are we really getting at? Yes. And just, right. and, and talk about it. Um, one of the questions that came in, I'd be interested to hear your take on this is, um, how does mas uh, masonry and Scottish Rite for that matter remain relevant? We're talking about transformation of character and characters based on values. Um, and this question was put to say, the nation in the society is moving away from these values. So how do you stay relevant? Yeah, but is it? it, I, it is, see, is exactly. It? I, 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 you know, I would say as a society, if you watched the 24-hour news cycle, you would begin to believe that is the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I believe that uh, it, it, is, it is proven throughout the ages that um, the basic human element, the basic person, uh, does not move away from their values. That we, we trade, as I said earlier, we, we end up uh, trading and or, or compromising on our values, but they're really still there. So does and that I mean that Masons are going to finish last because we're sticking to values in this society? No, I, I think Masons are going to f ultimately finish first because in the, in the long run, this is where, this is where those, those, those core values live. And, and even though society is, has a tendency to ebb and flow with a the, with the tide, uh, whatever that happens to be, whether it's political, uh, geopolitical, social, whatever it happens to be, the, the, the basic core values of, of humanity stay the same. And so if we're looking for those things, and I believe that the, new, the younger generation is absolutely grounded in those things, we're going to come out on the top. And they're frustrated because they're seeing the world. There's no example for them to say, I, I, this is wrong. Why is it I can't see something better? Well, why aren't we getting out there like we're doing now to say, here's an organization that's absolutely trying to provide that standard that you're looking for? The antithesis of the antithesis, what you might exactly. see you know, in the world around in the, you. In the world. You know, yeah. We talked earlier just off, off air about you know, the, the, the tremendously sad things that we're seeing going on uh, with these school shootings mm -hmm. and, and all of that stuff. And where did these young men lose their, their way? And is there a way for um, were they ever Were they ever shown a way? Were they ever shown, were they ever a, shown way? a way? And, you know, the, we're not going to change the tide of society on a dime, that's for sure. Uh, but uh, by, by being present, by being a, a bigger presence in the community and involved in these in men's lives mm -hmm. as a as an organization, back as it as it has been through history, uh, in, in showing that this is where you can come to gain that strength 
to stand up for your values and not compromise, then, then we're going to prevail in the long run. So from a personal standpoint, uh, Dave Price, one of the brothers, wrote in, uh, tell me where being a member of Scottish Rite has helped you in your personal life or your professional life or you know, a specific degree. We could say you know, the lesson in that degree translated exactly in this such a real situation. Can you point to one? Uh, oh, I, yeah, I, I can, can easily. easily. <laughs> but tell us a story. Certainly from, certainly from the perspective of just getting into an organization like the Scottish Rite, it's more of an umbrella process. So you're in your little, like I said, little silo lodge. Maybe you visited a couple of other lodges, but ultimately when you plug into Scottish Rite, York Rite, whatever, you suddenly are into a larger organization that, that straddles many lodges. Mm -hmm. So now you've got a much bigger community of, of brethren to, to communicate with and talk to and so on. Then you're going to the degrees and you think, okay, here's some more degrees. And I always find it fascinating when people say, oh, I've already seen that degree. Mm -hmm. No. Can, can you, do you not learn something the next time around and the next time? Because I think ultimately what humans need is a sense of rep repetition. We all tend to slip. And there's something about hearing about a moral value just stated over and over and over again. It just becomes a part of you. So when you hit some degree, and the one I'll bring up is the is the fourteenth degree. Mm -hmm. um, there's a there's a section in there. Did I know about this because I'm going to go this weekend. Uh, what I'll say, <laughs> you'll know it's coming up. But it's a, it's more of a it's a different kind of style from some of the other degrees. It's a little bit more solemn. It's very quiet, and there's a section in there that basically asks you to reflect on yourself about your actions in the world. Have you treated people fairly? Have you been honest to your brothers? Have you stood up in the face of adversity? Things like this, you're asked this directly. Right. And you're not asked to answer. Mm -hmm. You're asked to say, in your own mind, have you thought about this? And, and you're sitting there and it's really very powerful. It is. Absolutely powerful. And so when you come away with that, you're going, wow. And as a person that's seen it all over, over and over and over again, it still hits me. Each time. Each mm. time. Each sure. Time. No doubt, and and as as a as a fire chief, you know I I, I have to, to serve a community, but also the people that work with and for me in the fire department, and uh, the the tenets of our profession of our our society uh, allow me to see those see those conflicting sometimes uh, you know wants you know that the the firefighters want a particular thing, but the community can only provide uh, so much. And then to be able to um, take into consideration all of those things uh, is, is a, really a reflection of what Masonry has taught me, to be able to look at the bigger picture and then say, okay, so what's, what's for the benefit of the, 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 the masses? Okay, that's something that I can, I can then translate to my firefighters and say, so if we do this, and this is going to then uh, make us a better fire department because we're going to be able to save money and we're going to be efficient and effective and then also uh, make the greater good get what they're paying for. Uh, th those are all reflections of what, what we learn here. Mm -hmm. Now, um, one of the things, uh, a question came in about uh, fatherhood. And obviously these, uh, I can see where this is very, very uh, easily translatable if you reflect on treating yourself and acting in a certain way. But, but perhaps um, in, in more of a direct way, um, thinking about teaching um, your children, um, is this something, you know, many years ago, and maybe not that long ago, actually, um, you know, you weren't even uh, necessary you know, to tell your son that you were a Mason. I, you know, um, what happens today? Do you talk to your, uh, and talk about what you've learned in Masonry directly? Do you use it indirectly? Um, what guidance can you have for fathers, especially new fathers? I think that the, the kind of values that, that are promoted in this and the fact that they know that you're doing these because you're open about, hey, I'm going to a meeting and they can see you're all dressed up and you're heading out to these Not things. You only dress like that. Oh, yes, <laughs> the only time you're going, dad's <laughs> going out to a meeting. Um, but, but there's a sense, and I can't say, to be honest with you, that I've done any direct communications with my son that says, okay, I just did this from masonry into this. But I think the, the point of it is is that because I've been transformed from the from the... Um, effects of, of my Masonic connections, that just naturally flows into what I do and, and how I treat my son and my family. 
it, it's not a it's not a one-to-one -one thing okay I, I learned this today so I'm gonna apply that in my family life I think it's more of a it, it gets back to that transformative feature over time I find myself being thinking about these things so when I when I come to the family and I think about discussions with my son about various topics the Masonic concepts are just gonna come out and he knows that I'm going to masonry and he knows that these are the things that we we talk about so it sounds like what some of what you guys are really saying is that it's important to um, whether it be ritual or not to to really have discussions about what it is absolutely so it sounds like there needs to be a lot more discussion yes among the, the this is what we're trying to do tonight but from a one-to-one -one or in a lodge um, to say why are we doing this what just happened and it's um, if it's not happening from the the, uh, the officers you know and you're just someone ask a question um, it sounds like that's a big part of it which is to just in repetition I understand and I don't mean repetition in terms of memorization right that's a big part of it but in other words peeling back the layers of, of these things over time and participating um, and it sounds like it's an, a, a really an important part of transformation. And I think one of the things that we actually, you can even see this, this action here as a model on a small scale for what the lodges or the brothers can do on their own. In other words, we're, we're having there's a little really no Q&A. We, just be doing this. we it's, could be... It's okay to ask. Yeah. It's right. okay to ask. If there's something that you don't understand as a brother, it's okay to ask. And it's okay for your children to ask and say, hey, Dad, what is this all about, you know? I mean, they see you getting all dressed up, and, and you know, I know for my kids, they're proud. They're proud that their dad is, is a Mason and what that stands for because it's something that we've, we've talked about. It's something that we, you know, we don't, it's, it's not hidden. It's not a secret anymore. My grandfather was a Mason, but I used to have to sneak into his room and look at his fez and yeah. never really understood what any of it meant because it was, you know, we, he wasn't allowed to talk about it. Uh, that's not the case anymore. We're allowed to say that, you know, this is a place where, you know, I go to be with men who are doing good things on a daily basis and are part of, uh, are part of really good things, and, and it's something to be proud of, and, and that transforms them as well. I'll tell you a funny little anecdote um, that you reminded me of. Um, my son um, got wind of uh, the fact that there's secrets, and he said, tell me, you know, what they are. What's the handshake? You can tell me. You can tell me. Come on, I'm not going to tell anyone. And I said, Noah, it's not that whether or not I can tell you, but I took a promise not to tell. Bingo. So what what would that say about me mm -hmm. if I took a promise that I wouldn't tell you, and then I went and told you? Right. And he... And there's the tip. <laughs> there it is, for your right son. there. That's it for him, right there. You just, he, you just it's not, gave it's not whether or not you know it. <laughs> you know? Masonry 101. You just right gave there. him Masonry 101. <laughs> and he thought about it, and he couldn't argue with it. For once <laughs> in his life, he didn't have a, have a smart answer. Um, you know, we, we've only got another minute or so before um, I want to um, make sure that we get to some of the things we did promise. Um, uh, something exciting tonight. So, uh, and we'll have a chance to come back and say one last word. But maybe you know, just a, a quick um, thing in terms of what one of the questions is what can we do as masons now that it isn't maybe a secret to go out and and get the real story to people um, you know to get out and say how do we how do we show people what masonry really is is there anything that that you guys would um, and especially you you're both in somewhat public situation you as a professor and you as a, a, a civic leader um, Tell me, what, what can we do? We, we have to be willing to be honest about what it is that we do, mm -hmm. uh, you know, one night a week or a month or oh, yeah. whatever it is, right? Yeah, we we have to be honest about that, and, and we have to be able to say and be proud that we're Masons. And, you know, like Sandy said, you know, wear that ring proudly, and when somebody asks, say, how, how, how much time do you have? Because this is a real important thing. Uh, and in, in society, we've got to get the square and compasses out. You know, our grandmaster in Massachusetts is saying that all the time, you know. We've got to get the square encompasses out in front of the, the media and in front of your, your community and say, these are the good things that we're doing. And, uh, and, and let it be known. Maybe not be quite as humble and, and say, yeah, you know, Masonry is doing an incredible job for so many people, and these are the things that we're doing. Mm, cool. Well, um, before we run out of time, I just want to make sure that we, uh, we get to... Uh, one of the things, and it, what's important for folks at home to know is that they can continue this conversation. The most wonderful thing about this is that we want this to be an ongoing conversation. Right. And one of the ways that we can do this is a new feature on the website 
um, with discussion forums. And I want to turn it over to uh, Linda Patch, and, and you guys know Linda. She's really been um, behind the scenes, the, the architect of a lot of the changes uh, in the communications from the, uh, the Scottish Rite along with others, um, and, and most specifically in the fabulous website that, that, uh, that we now have. Yeah. So um, I want to, and I, I'm, I'm dying to say this. <laughs> I'm going to throw it back to you in the studio, Linda. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. We have an exciting announcement for the members of the Scottish Rite Northern Masonic Jurisdiction. But first, just a moment to reinforce that we keep digging deeper into what you told us in the 2016 survey and the suggestions that we continue to get from you, the member. I want to reiterate what Commander Gladly also said. You're asking, we're giving. You wanted more education, so we launched the Hograd Academy and we're launching this series of online, interactive live streams that explore Masonic values in everyday life. As members, you told us you wanted a place to connect and to continue these discussions um, after the events were over. And to that end, tonight we're launching a new member discussion forum on the website, and you can see what it looks like here. You can continue the discussion from this amazing evening on the forum and find ways to connect with you brothers. The forum is in the member center on the website. If you've registered, you will see it in the drop down. You can click and you're in. If you haven't registered, click on the member center and create your single sign on account. It's that easy. There are places all over the internet hosting Masonic discussions. Some are questionable, but most, some are not, but mostly they're hard to find and keep up with. We wanted to bring our members in the house and nurture brotherhood through conversation. Lastly, I want to say here at headquarters, we are listening and we will continue to do so. We're responding and we're trying hard to provide an array of programs and services that you asked for. And we can assure you, we'll keep at it. Thank you and good evening. Okay, in the minute or two that we have left, um, you know, I'd love to hear some final thoughts and you know, what you hope uh, people get out of it and really just uh, what you would say in closing. So for me, and I want to thank the Northern Masonic Jurisdiction and you, Len, for facilitating tonight. If you're a new Mason, uh, jump in with both feet. There's so much there that you can, you can, you know, indulge yourself in and it, it, it really is uh, going to provide you with the answers you've been looking for. If you're a, a, a admitted brother or, or a rusty brother as we may call them you know come back come back and and find what it is you were looking for because the the it's it's different than it was and mm -hmm. and uh, I think you'll find that the opportunities that you were originally seeking uh, are are there for you now and and if you're uh, an old timer if you've been around for a while and you you're part of the you know the fabric of your lodge um, make sure that you are that example on a daily basis and 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 make sure that you're reaching out to those new members, whether they're young or old, and, and showing them the way and giving them the guidance that they need uh, to get the best out of themselves. Yeah, and I'd, I'd like to thank uh, the Northern Masonic Jurisdiction also for putting together this amazing whole program that's going on. It's exciting to watch mm -hmm. as a Mason. So I, I am hoping that the same thing infuses with everybody else. And I think that given the time frame that I've been a Mason, things are so different from when I first started to where we are now things are changing. It really is happening. We just happen to be at the bottom of the barrel here with, with the turnaround and now we're hoping to kind of get up and that we've got this going forward in an absolutely amazing way. I'm excited for what I'm seeing here and I hope that that can infuse to everybody else to say, man, this is, this is our time to get out there and start making this change. And I'm seeing that in the younger folks that are around me. And so I'm hoping that this is the kind of launching point and thing that they can see and say, Man, that's exactly what I've been looking for. Let's move forward. Terrific. Well, I love your energy. I love everything you guys have to say. That's all the time that we have tonight. And uh, I would like to uh, put out the thanks as well uh, to both of you, John and Sandy. It's been wonderful. Pleasure. Commander Glatley and the Supreme Council, obviously, for their leadership. Uh, to Linda and Jim Dill uh, to be putting it together, and Dave Dill and his team, who you don't see, but this is why it works. Um, and, uh, of course, to our, our brothers who, who make this possible. Thank you so much for being with us, and we will talk again real soon.